right, what's going on guys? Welcome again to the Government Cheese. Today we're gonna go over an exciting topic, something that I feel is exciting, um, but it's something that really holds a lot of businesses back, especially when they're just getting started. It's how do we read and properly respond to a solicitation? All right, so how do we read and respond to a solicitation? That's what we're gonna go over today. All right, so first thing we gotta understand is that there's three basic types of solicitations. And I'm gonna um, talk about these in order of, I'd say, complexity. So first you're gonna have your IFBs. That's your invitation for bid. So an IFB is going to be your least complex um, solicitation. Typically an IFB is just going to be submitting a price based on the services that are going to be rendered and filling out your standard forms, whether it's a 1442, 1449, um, whatever standard form it's written on, you're going to fill in your price and basically submit that that's all it takes for an ifb very simple i tell all my students when you're just getting started in the game go after ifp ifbs don't waste your time on anything else because a you may not have the past performance or the technical performance to be able to put together a proper proposal but then b you just don't have the confidence and at the end of the day that's really what it boils down to for a lot of people is building up the confidence to be able to submit so ifbs is where you guys want to start if you're just starting out all right your next um, is going to be your RFQs. That's your request for quotations. So a request for a quotation is going to be very similar to an IFB in that you're just basically going to be providing a straight up price, but then they will also have possibly some other factors for award. So they may ask you just to include a brief write-up of your prior experience. They may ask you to put in a brief write-up of your um, an approach. So an RFQ is going to be an IFB, which is your price, with um, another determinative factor. The difference between an RFQ's determinative factors and like an RFP is in an RFQ, you're just stating, for example, if they ask about past performance, you're not giving prior jobs and contact information. You're just saying, we have experience doing X, Y, Z. Okay. Now, the last type, which is the most complex, which is what most people are familiar with, is your RFP. That's your request for proposal. Listen, guys, if you're just getting started in government contracting, stay away from RFPs. I'm just going to keep it real with you. You're going to waste a lot of your time because you don't have the experience to put it together. You don't have the confidence to propose properly, right? Start with your IFBs. Start with your RFQs. Work your way up and then get into RFPs. But if you happen to see an RFP that is like the perfect solicitation for your business, by all means, go after it but I want you to understand the difference, right? So an RFP is your full scale proposal. That's what most people are used to when they think government contracting, they think I'm gonna have to put together this elaborate proposal and everybody's heard the horror stories of 100 page documents and all of that. If you don't have what it takes, guys, just stay away, right? Build up to that. But if you wanna give it a try, like I said, it's no problem. I'm gonna walk you through it today so that you understand it. That's the biggest thing for a lot of people, like I said, is the confidence because they don't properly understand exactly what the solicitation is asking them to propose on, and then they don't understand how to put it together, right? So let's start with the hardest first. Like I said, let's jump right into RFPs and let's get the scary monster out of the way, all right? So what I want to do is basically walk with you and go through line by line of an RFP so you can understand really what they're asking for. Guys, the biggest thing about solicitations and responding to solicitations is reading reading is fundamental they taught us that in kindergarten read 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 your solicitations people i promise you if you read your solicitation you will not go astray and you will find it very easy to respond to all right so starting from the top you're going to have your solicitation number then you've got what solicitation type is it is it an ifb is it an rfp is it an rfq we see this one as an RFQ, uh, P, so that means it's a request for proposal. What does that tell us? That tells us that it's going to be a full-scale uh, proposal, meaning we're going to have to do a full write-up on this, all right? So once again, if you're just getting started, one of the quick and easy ways to decipher whether or not you want to bid on something, you open it up, you look at the first page. If you see it's an RFP and you know you don't have what it takes to put together a proposal, close it up, go on to the next one, all right? Then you're going to have um, your issue date your project number, your issued by, and your address offers to. This is a big one as well because a lot of times, a lot of times, the office that's requesting 
um, the work to be done and the office that you're going to submit your questions to versus submit your invoicing or even your offers to, they don't all necessarily have to be the same office. So it's imperative that you really understand who's issuing the, the, um, the work, who do you send your offers to, who are you doing the work for, right? And then who are you submitting payments to? And on this first page, you're actually going to find out all of that information. So as we see here, this is who, we're, who it's being issued by. This is who we're sending our offers to. But see this right here? This is the actual location of where the work is being done. And right here, you see the wider workflow receipt. This is who we're actually going to be submitting our invoice into. So on the first page of this document, it actually gives us a lot of information if we know what we're looking for. All right. Next block we're going to go to is block 11. It's going to tell us our uh, period of performance. So we see on this we have 270 days to complete. We have 10 days to begin um, once we receive our notice to proceed. The performance period is mandatory versus it being negotiable. That's another big thing. People often ask, well, you know, what happens if I go over or, or am I held to a certain time? If this box is checked, like you see here, and it says your period of performance is mandatory, your period of performance is mandatory. If your period of performance is negotiable, it's just that. It means you can go in there and say, hey, uh, government, I think it's going to take me 350 days to do this project. But if you give me 420, I know I can get it done. Right. You can negotiate those things. Remember, it's a contract. Right. That you're going to be uh, executing. Contracts have to be executed by both parties. So they have to be agreed upon by both parties. A lot of times people think that when you're doing business for the government, it's just, you know, one way and that's it. In reality, it's not there. It's a contract. So it has to be agreed upon by both parties. All right. So the rest of the blocks here, 12, 13 are just more um, information about this offer in specific. Now, this page here is where you actually have to do your filling out. So you'll see where it says offer right here must be completed fully by your offer. All right. So block 14, you're going to put all of your information. Block 15, your phone number. Block 16, your remittance address. If it's different than your um, your office address. What does that mean? Your remittance address is where they're going to actually remit payments to. Now, in the, you know, the times that we live in now, it's not as common to get paid via check. But back in the day, like when I started and, you know, wires, ACHs, those weren't things that were commonly done. They would actually mail you out a check via snail mail. So if you had like a P.O. box that all your checks went to, you'll put it in your remittance address. All right. Um, block 17, that's going to be your amount. So that's going to be the amount that you are saying that you can do this job for. All right. Right above it is something I want to note out as well right here. So this is telling the government how many days your offer is going to be good for. Right. That's that's big as well. All right. Um, next thing we have is when we get into block 18. The offer agrees to furnish you know payment performance because it's construction. Block 19, your acknowledgement of amendments. That's major. And this can be something, guys, if you don't fill out this block, you will automatically be disqualified. So if there are amendments that come out for the solicitation, you need to mark the number and put the date that the amendment was issued in the solicitation. It may also tell you to include a copy of the first page of the amendment signed, but that'll be later on. All right. Next thing you're going to do blocks 20 sign date and add your position. You see block 21, everything down there is going to be uh, to be completed by the government. All right. Now, one thing that we got to understand, let me just go back to this page. Guys, for the most part, that's it. Once you submit, once you fill out those standard forms with that signature right there, that's that's 90 percent of your solicitation response is filling out your standard form and signing. The things that happen past here typically are a lot of common documents that go in every solicitation, right? So I'm going to tell you some highlights that we're going to look for once we get past this page. Some of the things I want to look for is I want to look for our statement of work, or as you'll commonly heard it referred to as an SOW. That SOW is going to tell you exactly what it is that you're going to be performing, all right? Next thing I want to look for is I want to look for my instructions to offers. So my instructions to offer a section is going to be the section that tells me exactly what I must do to submit successfully on this uh, solicitation. It's very important 
because I don't know how many times a day I get people that call me and ask me for a proposal uh, template. You got a proposal template? You got? Can you send me a proposal template? Guys, your instructions to offers is your proposal template, all right? If you understand how to read your solicitation, like I said in the beginning, everything that you need is included in the solicitation, all right? So we wanna find our SOW, we wanna find our instructions to offer. Last thing we wanna find is we wanna find our method of evaluation. Our method of evaluation is the section in this solicitation that's going to tell us exactly how the government is going to evaluate proposals for award. It's very important because that's what's going to help you put your proposal together. If you don't know how they're going to evaluate you for award, you're shooting in the dark, which is another reason why I'm not a fan of people using stock proposal templates. Because if you use a stock proposal template and you include information that is not part of their evaluation factors, or you do not include information that's a part of the evaluation factors, you could disqualify yourself simply for being lazy. Guys, don't be lazy. It's, it's just not worth it. Just read. All right, let's dive into this. All right, so as we go to our next pages, we start to see all the different sections. All right, these sections are, like I said, standard forms. A lot of this information is regurgitated from previous areas. Like this is your service uh, and price and cost section. This is just telling you the work that you're doing. You're gonna put a unit rate to it and an amount to it. This is, like I said, your SOW. One of our most important things because we wanna know exactly what it is that we're proposing on. Next section is max packaging and marketing, not used in this one. Inspections and acceptance, another good section. Why? Because remember what I told you, the person who you may be submitting your offer to versus the person who you're doing the work for typically are going to be two completely different people in two completely different offices. And we see that the person who's going to be accepting and inspecting all of our work is this individual at this address. Very important because you need to know who you are working for. Deliveries and performance, same thing. This is going to tell us exactly our delivery schedule. Like we talked about before, we have 270 days from our NTP to complete and this is who we're going to be delivering the goods to which is andrew salisbury all right now next section jumps into our payment and our administrative stuff so this is going to be all your generic contract administration data for contracts with typically this agency all right so the next couple pages that you're going to see is going to be stock info it's telling you how this agency does work all right and that's exactly what you see you just see a lot of generic information here you have special contract requirements so it's giving you your work schedule and it's also telling you about any insurances that are going to be required from this page forward guys a lot of this information is going to be stuff that you've seen before most of it you've seen when you registered in sam because these are going to be your contract clauses so what they have to do in every contract is put a list of all the clauses that are going to be applicable to the contract so that you can't never say that you didn't know these things were included in your contract. One that you see here is your liquidated damages. Another one you see is small business um, program representation. All right. If this is some sort of set aside, it's going to be listed in here what the set aside is, how the small business requirements need to be met, and also how they need to be tracked. Okay. So that's what you have here. All right. Now we have more just general clauses that are included. All right. A lot of these, like I said, a lot of these are things that you may have read previously when you did your um, your reps and certs on your SAM. That's payment down here, section down here, payments under firm fixed priced um, construction contracts. So this is explaining you how payments will be made based on the type of contract that this is. Another question people ask, well, how does the government pay? Depends on what the contract is. In every contract, they're going to include a section that tells you exa exactly how they will pay. Also included in this section, because it's a small business set aside, is your Prompt Payment Act. Prompt Payment Act states that as a small business, you must be paid within 30 days of acceptance of an invoice. All right. So that's included in this. What does that tell us? That we know that we are going to get paid quick on this contract because it's included in the solicitation. All right. Continue to go through here. More information about prompt payment, how things are made more information on the contract itself how things are going to be governed all right a lot of stock data guys um things that as you do this work you'll continuously see these things over and over and over again so you can read them a couple times and they'll just become natural to you 
Next thing we got here is our list of attachments. So these are going to be all the different attachments that are associated with the solicitation. You need to make sure that you have access to every one of the documents that is on this list. If you do not, you need to reach out to the contracting officer because you don't want to miss something. Now, we're into our representation certifications, or as we affectionately call them, our reps and certs. These are all the things that you filled out in SAM.gov when you registered, okay? Unless there is an additional representation or certification added to the contract, which it will tell you, you do not have to fill this section out because as long as you are current and active in SAM, you have already filled this out, all right? So we'll just skim through this section um, because everything is already there. And now, the probably, if not the most important, second most important section in this entire solicitation is our instructions to offers. Why is this important? This is the section that's going to tell us exactly what we have to do to be um, deemed qualified when submitting on this solicitation. All right. So it's going to tell us right here how we need to submit, how we need to put things together, how the solicitation needs to be together. The first page of solicitation must show solicitation number, name, address, statement. Guys, it's this is your proposal template. OK, I'll say it again. This is your proposal template. All you're going to do is read all of these sections and make sure you answer every statement. They're not questions. They're actually statements because they're stating this is what must be included. They're not asking you to. They're telling you you must include the solicitation number. You must include the name, address, telephone number, and fax number of the offer. A statement specifying the extent of the agreement. Names, titles of of persons authorized to negotiate submission modifications you have to submit all of these things to be deemed um, a successful offer this does not mean that you will successfully be awarded this is just what they're going to say okay you follow the instructions we'll even look at you for an award all right very important section you have to read it it's not going to be the same with everyone everyone's going to be a little bit different so you have to read each instructions to offers in every solicitation so you know exactly what you need to do all right um after you get through your instructions to offer you're going to get into your type of contract this is where it's going to tell you what type of contract is this okay this is going to be a firm fixed price construction contract all right if you don't know what that is look up firm fixed price it'll explain to you exactly what governs a firm fixed price what it is and how you uh, work under it all right. Next section we get into is going to be your, your EEOC stuff. All right. So your equal opportunity employment stuff. Every government contract has some sort of goals associated with it. It is important that you read your solicitation so you understand exactly what goals you need to hit within your particular contract. And that's what's listed out here. Next section is going to be your service for protest. You know, if you have to. Then you get into more things. You get into your site visit, your provisions, your uh, deviations, all right, and everything there. Now we found the last section, like I said, probably if not the most important, second most important, your evaluation factors for award. You need to understand, guys, how is the government going to make an award on this solicitation? So let's go ahead and pull up that section now, all right? So now we are into our evaluation factors for award so in reading this we see that this is going to be an lpta a lowest price technically acceptable source selection what does that mean that means that the government's going to take all of the proposals that come in they're going to open them and they're going to say are they technically acceptable if you are acceptable technically they're going to stack your proposal up then they're going to say okay now let's put them in order from lowest to highest once they put them in lowest from high, lowest to highest, they're going to take the lowest one. That's your awarding. Very simple. Lowest price, technically acceptable. All right. That's what you see here. So first, the, the government will determine if the proposal conforms to the RFP requirements. Only conforming proposals will be eligible. Where do we find those proposal conforming requirements? That was in our instructions to offers. All right. Second, the government will use the following specific factors and sub factors to evaluate each uh, offers proposal. So now you're going to see their factors in which they want you to include. So they want you to include past performance. They want you to include prior experience 
And then, of course, it's going to be your price. So those are going to be your factors. Once again, guys, you take this information and this is what you use to build your proposal. OK, we're going to build our proposal based on the factors that they want to see. We're not going to include stuff that they didn't ask for and we're not going to include less. We're going to give them exactly what they're asking for. Thirdly, the government shall rank all technically acceptable offers by order of their proposed evaluated price and award to the lowest offer. OK, so if this was a different type of proposal and it was a best value, for example, then they would look at all the proposals and they say, which one provides the best value for the government? And the best value may not always be the lowest price. This one is not that lowest price, technically acceptable. One of the simplest RFP uh, selection criteria. You make sure you hit all your factors. You make sure that you are sending, submitting a conforming proposal. If you do those things and then you have the lowest price, they don't even go to number two. They stop right there. They don't care if number one, his price is $100 and number two's price is $100 and one cent. They never go to the other price. It is the lowest price is going to be your successful offer. All right. So hopefully that made sense. Like I said, we started with the, the, the big behemoth monster first, which is an R RFPs. Now we're going to go down to the next uh, level, which is going to be um, our, our RF Q's. Okay. So let's get us pulled up here on our RFQs. So very similar in how it's put together. All right. Still have all the same general information. The thing I love about RFQs and IFBs is that they're actually going to tell you right here, offer to complete these blocks. They're going to tell you exactly what blocks you need to complete. You can't mess up an RFQ or an IFB guys, because it's very simple. If you complete the blocks that it says complete, that's all you need to do. That's why I say in the beginning, when you're just getting started, stick to your IFBs and your RFQs. All right. Tells you all the same info, right? You have your date and time that your offer is due. You have your set aside type. You have your type of solicitation. You have your delivery to you have your administered by. Remember what I told you, the person who's administering your contract and issuing your contract may not be who you're delivering to, as you see in this particular example. All right. So how do we submit on an RFP on an RFQ? Excuse me. Offer to complete blocks 12, 17, 23, 24 and 30. You're going to you're going to fill out block 12, which is your discount terms. What are discount terms? We know that under prompt payment act as a small business, we're going to get paid within 30 days. The government will allow you to offer them a discount for expedited payment, meaning if you say, okay, government, I know you're going to pay me in 30 days as a small business, but if you pay me in five days, I will give you a 3% discount. So then you'll put that here. You'll put 3% at five days. And then, because once again, a contract is what? It's negotiated and signed off by both parties. As you can see here, you sign it and the government signs it. If they approve your discount terms, now you're getting paid in five days. It's that simple. Next block is going to be block 17. That's where you're going to put all of your information. All right. Then you're going to have block 23, which is your unit rate and your price, block 23 and 24, block 30, your signature blocks. Guys, that's it. Don't overthink it. That's an RFQ. And typically that's an IFB. That's all you have to do. OK, if this was an IFB, we would be done. Because it is an RFQ, we're going to continue looking through the solicitation and we're going to look for those same sections that we talked about previously on RFP. We're going to try to find our SOW if it's attached, which is our statement of work. We're also going to look for our instructions to offers and then our evaluation factors if they're included. OK, so now let's search through this proposal, this solicitation and see what we got. So because this is a multi-year contract, you see that they have uh, multiple blocks, 23 and 24, because you have to put the price for each option year. All right. Now we get into our clauses. Very similar, just like we saw last time. Very standardized. All right. All of our standard stuff. Now we see our invoicing instructions. And now we're still looking for bingo. There it is, guys. There is our instructions to offer and our evaluation factors. All right. So now, because this is an RFQ, like I said, guys, it's going to be real simple. Everything is right there for us. What are, what are our instructions to offer? Three things. Fill out your 1449, which is what we looked at. 
fill out a price quotation, and complete your reps and certs. Now, like I said previously, your representation and certifications are what you completed electronically on SAM. They'll tell you right here. The representation and certification section must be completed electronically on SAM.gov. So that means you do not have to go through here and fill out all of these reps and certs. Okay? You, they will accept your electronic um, reps and certs that you did as long as you are up to date. So before you submit on something like this, you have to make sure your SAM registration is up to date. And that's what it says right here. Offers must be registered in the system for award management. All right. So remember, instructions to officers, that's our proposal template. That's all it is, guys. Boom, boom, boom. You just got to make sure you do these three things. If you do these three things, you're good to go. All right. Now let's look at our uh, evaluation criteria. So we see our purpose for the award. Uh, we see our, our, our methodology for award is going to be best value. Okay. So now it's going to tell us exactly what that best value looks like. So considering three major factors, technical acceptance, past performance, and price. Quotations will be evaluated by performing a competitive evaluation uh, to determine which quotation represents the best value for the government. All right. So they're going to tell they're, they're doing best value and they're telling you how they're going to look at best value. Now, they're also saying that in this evaluation criteria, they want to see some technical capability. All right. So what is how do you do this? Read this section and then respond to it. Typically, the way you can do it is just by submitting a copy of your capability statement, but making sure that when submitting a copy of your capability statement, you touch on all of these factors. So touch on your technical capability, touch on your past performance. And then, like we talked about, your price is already going to be submitted because we submitted our price right here. All right. So we found our um, SOW. That was back up in all of our different. Um, that was back right here where it talked about all the different services that we're going to provide. All right. We found our instructions to offers and we found our valuation criteria. So now we're able to put this uh, quote together. Now, everything from here on out is going to be our offers, representation, certifications. Remember, we don't have to fill these out because it's telling us that it will accept the ones that we did on SAM.gov. All right, guys. And just like that, we're done. That is how you submit on an RFQ. Subsequently, it's the same way you're going to submit on IFB. And earlier, we talked about how you submit on RFP. Now you've got all the knowledge. You've got the game. Go out there and make it happen. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next video.